how to 10x your net worth this cycle. Wouldn't it be nice to walk away from this cycle with real gains rather than round trip your bags and take another 80 to 90% loss in the bear market? In this episode, we're gonna give you the insights you need to allocate your capital wisely and take profits at the top of this crypto cycle. Welcome to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. I'm Kyle Reedhead, your host for today's show. And at Milk Road, we believe that on-chain is the next online. This is the opportunity, and we're here to help you capitalize on it. Today, I'm joined by none other than Lark Davis, a longtime investor in both public and private crypto markets, as well as he has one of the largest audiences and reaches in crypto. He's got more than 1.2 million followers on Twitter, over 500,000 subscribers on YouTube, and a kick-ass newsletter called Wealth Mastery with over 120,000 subscribers. And it's always nice to get Lark's insights on the markets because he's a real OG in the space. This is his third cycle uh, in crypto. And he sees these markets from so many different angles. You know, he's a, been a builder and an educator in the crypto space for, for many, many years. He's involved in both private and public markets, as I, as I suggested. And so he just has a really good bird's eye view on really everything happening in the space. So we get into a lot of different narratives into how he sets up his portfolio, how he's seeing the cycle, uh, how he's going to time this cycle, uh, and just a lot of really good insights to help you capitalize on this cycle as well. Now, before we get into this episode, today's the last day for the Milk Road Radio competition to win free Milk Road swag and get free access to the Milk Road Pro newsletter. All you have to do to enter the competition is to follow and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on YouTube, wherever you're listening, and take a screenshot. And then just upload it to Twitter and tag at Milk Road Daily. Once you do that, you automatically enter the win. Uh, and within this week, actually, we are going to notify the winners of some cool Milk Road swag, as well as free access to the Milk Road Pro newsletter. And by the way, this is also the last day to get 25% off the Milk Road Pro newsletter. Uh, so if you want to get actionable insights and advice to successfully navigate this crypto cycle, which really goes really well with this episode itself, then sign up to Pro right now at 25% off. And don't worry, if you happen to win the free Pro access in the draw, we'll simply refund you. So it's all good. All right, friends, let's get into the episode. Lark, welcome to Milk Road Radio. It's actually not your first time on this show. First time branded as Milk Road Radio, but not your first time as you've been on a couple of times when it was previously Web3 Academy. But welcome to the new Milk Road Radio. Excited to sit down and drink a glass of milk with you. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a requirement. Jay and I actually talked about should we drink milk every time we do a podcast. But I don't know. People don't really drink milk all that much anymore. So no. <laughs> it's not my thing. I'm on the soy milk personally, but you know. Ooh, <laughs> soy milk. Okay. Let's just move off the milk subject. Then. Mark, we got lots to cover today. I want to talk all things markets, crypto markets. We're going to talk all about the cycle, where you think we're at in the cycle, what the cycle is going to be like. We'll talk narratives. We'll talk projects. We're going to get real deep. Before we do that, though, I feel like an important thing to just to like to do is, is zoom out real quick and just get an idea of one, what is your sort of like thesis around investing in crypto and how does it fit in your overall portfolio, assuming that you invest in something other than crypto? Maybe not. I think a large percent of us are, are all crypto, but that's fine. And then just answer, what is your time horizon when you're investing in crypto? Just so like everyone can have a, an idea of, you know, your sort of strategy here. Right. So that's, that's a big question. There's a lot to unpack there. So the thesis of investing in crypto, I think is pretty simple. This is one of the most disruptive technologies to come in a very, very long time. And that's what kept me in crypto. When I first got into crypto was 2017, I quit my day job, November, 2017, bear market started two months later, 2018 was a tough year. And there were a lot of moments of doubt, but anytime I had a moment of doubt, I just said to myself, this is not going away. Bitcoin's not going away. Crypto's not going away. This is going to be one of the biggest, most impactful technologies to hit the internet since the creation of the internet itself. And now we have AI, of course, which is massively impactful. It's going to go on to do huge things in everyone's lives as well. But this is the financial layer of the internet we're talking about right here. And the applications for it obviously are broad from simple payments, store value to digital ownership via NFTs to gaming currencies, decentralized GPU networks, and on and on and on. The use cases right now that are coming out are wild and very exciting. So the thesis is working out so far, and it's only going to get bigger. This is the thing. Crypto right now is a $2 trillion market cap. That's a baby. We're still less of a market cap than Microsoft or Google or Apple. Pretty sure those are all over $2 trillion right now. So this is a very interesting thing. We are very early in this technology. Now, you're not super early. Now, this is something to keep in mind right now. You're not super, super early. You're also not super late. This cycle, though, could be one of the big ones where we really go ramp up 
the total amount of people in the market and everything happening here and mainstream adoption as we see big games kick off and of course bitcoin etfs and all these sorts of things so every new cycle has new catalysts but the thesis continues mass adoption for cryptocurrencies is underway and we still have a long way to go we have about four to five hundred million people who have bought or used crypto most of those people of course are very casual don't do it very often we're going to see it become more of a part of everyday life as we continue through the cycles you know by 2032's bull market <laughs> 2033 <laughs> or whatever things will probably be pretty crazy and pretty well established will be in probably in tens of trillions by that point so this is the thesis of what you're investing in what i'm investing in when i look at crypto is and keeps me focused on the big goal in the market is where we're going where we've come where we're going the potential of the asset now time time this is an interesting one because different assets have different time factors there are things that i might get into and i'm looking at a quick flip maybe it's a couple of weeks or a few months and that's fine i think a lot of people get stuck into positions that are unable to sell and it's okay to do a flip in even in a bull market and i might sell something with the knowledge that you know what later it's probably going to go up more but i don't care because i got the two three four x whatever i wanted out of it now i'm going to take the cash do something else with it maybe take some money out of the market sacrilege i know but you're allowed to do that <laughs> maybe move it into some new coins maybe push it up from high risk into lower risk coins so there's that that's sort of the shortest end of the spectrum excluding any sort of you know very short time frame trades or anything like that then there's stuff that you're looking at holding for the entire cycle so that's a lot of the positions that i'm in right now in terms of altcoin stuff holding most of that for the entire cycle but as history has largely proven to us and i know a lot of people are going to argue this time is different things are fundamentally changing here for cryptocurrency markets and this is going to be the super cycle there will be no more giant corrections etc 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 well tell that to facebook who had what a 70 percent correction in 2022 apparently there are still massive corrections even for the biggest tech companies in the world okay so markets can be irrational all the time and crypto is a very irrational place at the best of times <laughs> So I would not count against irrationality, human greed, and human fear, because those are the main factors that drive crypto in, in many ways. Obviously, technological innovation is very, very strong, and that keeps everything chugging along. But in terms of these wild bull markets and crushing bear markets, they're very volatile because of this human element and the wild accessibility of cryptocurrencies and the massive leverage in the cryptocurrency markets that's so easily available to everyone. So this makes everything a little bit crazier in crypto. So for me, a lot of the altcoins that I'm buying will be sold at the end of the cycle. I don't see a strong case in holding many, if any, altcoins. Now, some stuff like NFTs, for example, if you have like, you know, some Grail NFTs, I don't have a CryptoPunk, but maybe I'll get one if I do well enough this cycle. <laughs> Something like that, you just buy it and hold it. You're not, that's not a flip, right? That's just a, you want to have it kind of possession. Something like Bitcoin. Obviously, you can hold that multi-cycle. I've got Bitcoin. I've been holding multi-cycle, held it through massive downturns. Obviously, if you want to try and swing trade that, you can, but you don't have to. There's tax implications when you do that, and there's all sorts of things. So, you know, these are all things you need to consider. Are you going to perfectly time the market? Because if you don't get out near the top and you sell 30 40% down, for example, for your Bitcoin, and then you're just trying to rebuy the bottom, the odds are really against you at that point that you're going to make that even profitably done because remember, you just paid a huge percentage of taxes, right? Now you're trying to perfectly buy the bottom. And if you don't perfectly hit the bottom, you're probably not going to really add that much more to your stack. So for yeah. a lot of people who are not paying attention to the market or just casual investors, that is a difficult strategy. Okay. But so there's very few assets. I just want to say there's very few assets that I think have a good potential for holding multi-cycle because the vast majority of them you probably just want to sell at the end of the cycle maybe you rebuy those positions later but the vast majority will try to probably get out at the end of the cycle yeah makes complete sense so long-term <laughs> bullish but only a couple assets that you're holding long term for the most part anything in the alt section you're sort of playing the cycle kind of thing sounds yeah. correct yeah, yeah that's right i think for the most part i'll be selling the altcoin portfolio down at the end of the cycle i'm not yeah. sure i'll keep any of them to be honest I'm on the same page. Let's talk about these cycles. Obviously, crypto is very cyclical in nature. If you've been in crypto, you can easily notice this. Even if you're not in crypto, you probably notice this. <laughs> Let's talk about this current cycle. We've had um, you know, a good run up in 2023. We've had a really good run up so far at the beginning of 2024 to start things off. Obviously, at all time highs now in Bitcoin, not many other assets at all time highs, any of the big ones anyway, but Bitcoin is. Where do you think that we're at in this current cycle? And also, as you answer that, maybe you can just explain what do you think drives these cycles as well? So what drives the cycles largely, of course, 
liquidity in the markets, obviously. And we had a big liquidity. The global liquidity bottomed in October 2022. FTX collapsed a couple weeks later. <laughs> that signaled the end of the bear market, essentially, which doesn't feel like it. It's really weird. But essentially, if you really start to break it down, the bear market starts at the top and the bear market finishes at the bottom. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it at the time. Right. But that's realistically kind of what happens. Hindsight, though, it's not easy to spot, obviously, but liquidity really drives these markets. And we've seen huge upticks in liquidity, of course, for cryptocurrencies. Risk appetites drive a lot of this market. Crypto is not immune to macro situations either. So this is all something you need to consider as an investor when you're looking at this space that we are definitely cycle driven. We are very strongly connected with what's going on in global liquidity markets, risk attitudes in the markets. Because look at what happened to tech stocks. We've, we've moved largely along with those because people got back into a risk attitude, right? People went risk off for a while. They sold tech stocks. They sold crypto down. Risk on came back on in early 2023 because of the AI boom and other factors and everything took off again. And then, of course, very specifically for crypto, we were lagging behind tech stocks for quite a while. And then BlackRock comes, announces the Bitcoin ETF play, and everybody realizes, because Bitcoin ETFs have been in application for a very long time. A lot of companies have been trying for a very long time to get them. But when BlackRock came, the game changed because it is BlackRock. Now, okay, so that's what drives markets. Now, where are we in the cycles? Look, I, I tend to look at about four approximate phases. Phase one is really the bottom of the bear market. That's kind of the, the most pessimistic time and the hardest time for people to invest, but obviously the hardest, highest ROI, best risk reward time to invest. And I was saying this on the channel when Bitcoin was 18, 19, 20K. I was saying, well, guys, what's, what's the risk reward here? Okay, coin's going to go much higher. Ethereum's going to go much higher. You buy today, what's your risk? It's going to go down to the 20, 30, 40, maybe 50% max, max, right? Worst case scenario. Okay, if you can hold through that, then your upside is massive. And if you don't buy and start averaging in, at least at, at these prices, you're probably not going to buy lower either. You're going to tell yourself you're going to buy lower. But the problem is when prices go lower, let's say you did get down to 10K like some people were calling for. Well, guess what? As soon as you get to 10K, guess what everyone starts doing? Oh, it's going to 3K now. And the goalposts keep shifting, which is why dollar cost averaging is so effective. Putting money in on these very pessimistic times when there's blood in the streets and all that kind of stuff. So that's phase one. Phase two, this is when sort of broad accumulation starts happening. Markets are recovering. Liquidity is coming back into the market. People are starting to make money on stuff again, which started happening in sort of early to mid-20, like March 2023, Pepe came out and stuff like that. People made a bunch of money on that. So these started early movers in the space started making a lot of money. People start getting interested in crypto again. People started showing up again. The pessimism started to fade. PTSD started to fade away a little bit. Accumulation was the name of the game at that time. So that accumulation phase essentially lasts from then when we start to see this real change in sentiment to when we start hitting new highs. So arguably, we just entered into what I see as phase three of the market where Bitcoin's hit a new all-time high just barely, but we're starting to hit back into price discovery. We're heading in that direction. Ethereum's still lagging, of course, a bit behind. Solana's still a bit behind, but we'll see these other major coins catching up as time moves on. But we're starting to head in that direction. So this is actually the phase where the biggest volatility happens, the most money making happens. And this really lasts until what I like to think of as phase four, which is a very short period. That's the get the heck out of the market before everything collapses phase. And that's, of course, typified by all the usual signals we want to look for, the social sentiment signals, whether it be, you know, Time Magazine, New York Times posting front page articles about how everyone's getting hilariously rich with crypto, Coinbase app and number one or number two or three position of all downloaded apps, stuff like this. A lot of technical things you can look at as well. Pi cycle top indicator, MVRVZ score hitting in the pink box, a lot of stuff like this. There's a lot more we go into. Maybe we don't need to do it right now, but that's the selling phase. And the selling phase is actually short. It's maybe four to eight weeks max, two to three weeks is a real sweet spot. Historically, that's how it's played out. Maybe it's different this time, of course, famous last words, but <laughs> that's how things generally play out. Now, phase three, where we currently are, you're going to see huge markups start to happen. So uh, a lot of people will have missed the best entries, obviously, right? If you're just coming now, you're just buying crypto today for the first time, or you're just paying attention again for today, you missed out on a lot of the best prices, sorry, but they're not going to go back down there. You're not going to pick up you know, chain link for five bucks anymore. You're not going to pick up Bitcoin for 20K anymore. It's just not what's happening right now. Maybe there's a black swan event that everything goes to shit, but nobody can predict that. Okay. So from what we can see in the market, structure wise, it's very, very unlikely that you're going to get those kind of price points again. However, this is also a time when massive money making happens because yes, you can still buy fundamentally interesting coins 
that are going to have great potential. Yeah, and you're not going to get a, a 50x like you could have, but you can still get a 10 or 20x, which is not bad. Come on. Come on. That's all right, right? Not Plus, bad. The one, thing, the one thing people need <laughs> to understand in the crypto space is like, it's 10x is amazing. It's not not bad. Oh, but the problem is a lot of people in crypto haven't really invested outside of crypto. Even like a 20% increase should be like, it's really good. But in crypto, it's like, what? The markets aren't even moving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know my gold's up like, uh, you know, 20% this year. I'm yeah, like, right. yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I want to say as, as well about phase three is that it's the time in the market when very rapidly the risk reward scenario changes. Every dollar the prices mm -hmm. go up is the more risk you're taking when you buy for less right. reward. OK, so that's something a lot of people need to understand. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people will actually enter in phase four, which is literally the worst possible time to enter, the highest risk time to enter. And they basically just make themselves exit liquidity for everybody else who's been here. If, of course, those people remember to sell. But during phase three, there's lots of great opportunities, still lots of great coins to buy, lots of great gems to find, lots of new launches coming, lots of airdrops to farm. Uh, lots of DeFi coins to farm, lots of hot ecosystem plays to find, lots of hot new token sales. So there's lots of stuff. Market is very frothy, huge volatility. It's a great time for making money. But we've got to remember, phase four will come if you don't sell. That's a problem. Phase four <laughs> is when everyone's the most euphoric. And it feels mm -hmm. like the time where you want to put the most money in. And it's, you see it all the time. This is when all your friends start to come back in and they want to like put everything they have into it. And oftentimes people are like, it's the hardest time to sell, even though it's the time where it makes the most sense. But hopefully people can wrap their heads around that. Let's talk about this cycle a little bit further. So you think we're in phase three, not the time to sell yet, but maybe eventually or soon the time to start thinking about taking profits. Still a lot of ROI to be made here at this point. Mm -hmm. How do you think this cycle plays out? You talked a little bit about a super cycle before. You said that's definitely mm -hmm. not the case. That doesn't happen in anything really. A lot of people have mentioned like an accelerated cycle because the ETF seem we've run up so fast in Bitcoin. Are you on that side? Are you on just it's a normal cycle as per usual? Is it a super cycle? Like, what do you think in this time around? It's very interesting. Obviously, there's a very compelling cases that can be made for all three accelerated four year and super cycle. Essentially, if you really want to dive into it, Crypto has been in what is essentially a giant super cycle. It's just a very, very volatile one. So it doesn't fit the standard definition of what a super cycle is because we have these 70, 80, 90% drawdowns in a lot of assets across the crypto space. So it doesn't feel like you're in a super cycle. But the reality is, if had you bought Bitcoin for basic, except if you'd bought in that like one week when it was at 73K, but basically anybody who's ever bought Bitcoin in the past is in profit right now at the time of recording this video. And that's pretty crazy to think about. So prices just keep going up, fiat keeps being debased, all that kind of stuff, okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind here. But if you look at, I think, where the uh, the overall trend is going and how the market's ro rolling out, I'm not super convinced right now by the accelerated cycle theory. I know people are going to be like, well, but, you know, it happened earlier. We got a new, time, new haul time high before the Bitcoin halving. Mm, yeah, we did. And that might lead to what I think could be a possible scenario, which is a, a double top scenario. And you might think about oh, double top scenario. That sounds ridiculous. It's exactly what happened in 2021. And it's exactly what happened in 2013, where we have a huge rally, big top. Maybe we get up to 90K, maybe we get over 100K even. And that's where the first top for Bitcoin is. And we, we talk about Bitcoin as the price indicator because it's where it's going to be a general indicator of where the whole market's moving, right? It's an easy guidepost for us. So maybe we do that happens, then we have a huge correction in the market, like 30, 40, 50% correction. The kind of correction that makes everybody think it's over exactly like happened in 2021, exactly like happened in 2023, 2013, sorry, not that I was around in 2013, investing in crypto, but you can look back and you can see how the market's played out. So that's, I think, a real potential scenario where we have this early top and then a much higher top 12 months later or something like that. That's a real possibility. But my intuition is telling me that until proven otherwise, we are still in a four-year cycle. Maybe we get a double top scenario playing out, but it's still a four-year cycle, essentially, where late 2024, 2025, oh, we're in 2024 now, late 2025, you either are going to sell or that's going to be it. And when that happens, and here's the thing, here's the thing people need to remember. When late 2025 comes, assuming again, we get a four-year cycle theory, which I think is still the most compelling case for me personally, I'm ready to be proven wrong and I will adapt my opinion based on what I'm seeing in the markets. I don't want to look at the market and see what I want to hear from the market. I want to look at the market and see what's actually happening in the market. So if I see the signals that markets are looking like things are getting pretty cooked and that could just be the first top signal, it's hard to say, well, that's going to be a, a tough one to try to uh, analyze later on. But late 2025, I think it really becomes that situation where it's time to get out of the market. And 
maybe I will mid curve it. And we really are in the super cycle and everything's just way more bullish. And all these things that you're being told are going to come true, but chances are it's just the euphoria that's going to hit everybody. And when Bitcoin gets up to, I think we could go as high as maybe like 250K. The 3.618 Fibonacci line brings us to 215K, which is where we hit, by the way, at 3.618 last cycle. So if you pay attention to that again, maybe we go slightly above it, like we did last cycle, and maybe we get up to like 250K. But the problem is at 250K, people aren't going to be saying, wow, now, now's the time to be responsible and book some profits. Now is going to be the time when everybody's saying, this is the new paradigm of money. You need to bet more. Go remortgage your house, sell it's your kids, buy more Bitcoin, go all in right now. If you're just getting here, now is when you have to buy everything immediately. Highest risk time in the market. Okay, so that's going to be the time to sell, even though everyone, the herd is telling you not to sell but only contrarians really make it in markets. And you have to be a bit contrarian because the herd always loses. I just read a book. I think it was called Boom and Bust. I can't remember, but it was all about all the big hype cycles that we've had outside of crypto. Like it was talking since the, I don't know, 300 years ago. There was one that happened with like Australian land and like, I don't know, all the different ones. And these cycles are all just human psychology, right? We just get super greedy and we go through the same sort of motions every single time. And so I kind of am the same. I think we just have a similar cycle to what we've always had. And really, it's because of what you mentioned at the beginning, which was these cycles are controlled by liquidity. So it doesn't really matter what happens in terms of like innovation and things with crypto. As soon as liquidity goes the opposite way and there's less money to be put in crypto, that means there's less demand, there's less people that can buy. And so ultimately, even if the innovation is still improving and we all think it's going to be the future, there's just really no other option for it to go back down at that point. And it seems these liquidity cycles seem to be every four years. So I'm kind of in the same boat that I think it's kind of the same as, as all the other cycles. Maybe we have a top, a, a double top. Maybe we don't. It doesn't really matter. We always kind of have like a 50% dip in the middle of a cycle, except for, I think, 2017. We didn't have one that was 50, but we had a 40%. We had like a 41% yeah, yeah, right. dip. <laughs> like, close right. enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things I always try to think about, though, is like, what is different this cycle than the last one? I mean, the, the first one, the obvious one is, well, we hit all-time highs before the halving. Obviously, the ETFs are different. There's a big kind of unknown right now, what's going to happen with the ETH ETF in about a mm -hmm. month from now. So like, that could make some changes for us or make some differences. Any other things that are this cycle that you're just like, yeah, this is completely different than we've seen in any other cycle? You know, what's interesting about the this time is different ideology is that this time is always different. Right. History does not repeat, right? But the question is, is how fundamentally different are things? And the one factor, as we just mentioned, that never, ever changes in markets is the investor, human psychology. And right. even like the big institutional funds, most hedge funds underperform the S&P 500 because they're susceptible to the same stuff. They're guys sitting behind desks, clicking buttons. They are susceptible to the same fear and greed. They make the same mistakes on average. So if hedge funds can't do it, your average investor obviously <laughs> struggles to try to win in those regards. So look, the hype cycles are a very real part of the entire scenario. Everything is happening here in the cryptocurrency markets. And I think it's important to pay attention to this whole human element in terms of how cycles repeat and the way cycles play out and all this sort of stuff. So don't bet against people. <laughs> I mean, bet yeah. against people, but you know, don't bet against people to not do what they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the one thing that doesn't change, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, let's talk about positioning then. It sounds like whether we have a double top, whether we don't, you're thinking that the the ultimate top of this cycle anyway comes at some point in 2025. Sounds like you're thinking maybe on the later half of 2025. But of course, you think crypto doesn't end at the end of this cycle. It continues as normal. We just have these, these cycles. You said alts, probably going to sell or try to sell at the top of the cycle or somewhere near it. But there's certain assets you might hold, whether that's Bitcoin, maybe you had a crypto punk. These are things you just hold long term. So let's talk about sort of positioning right now of where you're at and maybe what you would change throughout the rest of the cycle, or maybe something has to happen for you to change certain things. Can you walk us through sort of your, your strategy on that right now? <laughs> right now, I am balls deep in altcoins, balls deep in crypto, really, <laughs> when it comes down to it. I do invest in other asset classes. For some reason, I have some gold and silver. For some reason. Anyway, yeah. kind of like, I kind of know, I kind of liked it. It's like, I want to buy some of this stuff and I bought some. It's fine sitting there. Don't know. I might turn to something different later, but I have stocks. I like stocks I like that dividend stocks for like renewable energy companies or whatever, right? There's lots of great renewable energy stocks that pay great dividends. So I invest outside of crypto. Don't talk about it that much. And obviously there's a lot of great things in the tech world and there's a lot of great AI companies and all these things are going to reach wild valuations. Fantastic. Love it. But right now it's crypto season and very deep in crypto right now. I've been increasing a lot my exposure to altcoins because the reality is 
it's quite funny. Even when Bitcoin moves up like 5%, everybody goes, oh my gosh, Bitcoin's up 5%. This looks like, yes, it is exciting. But the best case scenario that I'm looking at right now for Bitcoin, we go up to 250K. Okay, that from the current price is 220, 230% returns, which is great for my Bitcoin stack that I have and have been holding on to for a while. Realistically, altcoins are going to outperform so dramatically in that scenario that that's where the big money is going to be made. And that's always been the case in crypto. Well, not always, because I guess you go back far enough in crypto, there weren't really any altcoins to speak of. But since there have been altcoins around, certainly since the 2017 <laughs> cycle, when it was the big cycle for altcoins, it has been the case. So for me, I'm very positioned in altcoins. I've been repositioning to an extent, looking at where the big hype is probably going to be. For example, the base ecosystem Coinbase is layer two. That's something I think not to fade without a doubt, because you start to look at the fundamentals of every way that Coinbase can bring on chain. And the fact that it works, that's a pretty big bonus. Solana, Solana, <laughs> come on. Solana will fix their problems. I know it's easy to kick somebody when they're down. People tend to love to do that when anything is struggling in crypto or anybody's struggling. The herd usually shows up to kick, every, kick them while they're down. That's a pretty popular thing to do, unfortunately. But my guess is that Solana has enough brains and money behind it that they'll easily fix their problems quite soon and that Solana will continue to be a major force in the market for the cycle. It's really interesting to think about where most of the money is going to be made because I think there'll be a small section of sectors that probably make 90% of the gains this cycle. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to make money elsewhere. It's just that most of the money will be made in certain places. And we're already starting to see that play out in real time. The Solana ecosystem, the base ecosystem, to a lesser extent right now, we're seeing you know, Avalanche has done really well and they've done brought out some good meme coins. I think some ones to definitely pay attention to be Mantle. Mantle, I think, very under the radar. It's like the layer two launched by Bybit. But they've actually done really good job at driving value to the MNT token, which Arbitrum, Arbitrum, come on. You've been on the market for like a year and a half and there's zero value for your token. Zero value. Why would anybody buy? I bought it for a while. I finally sold my bags. It just wasn't a crew value. Right. And if your token can't have a mechanism for accruing value, then you're going to be participating in governance. Well, guess what? You know who <laughs> controls the governance? The teams and the VCs. Unless you have $100 million you want to go spend on buying tokens so that you can make decisions on how Arbitrum is governed, if you are yeah. some crazy person, then I guess you can go do that. But most people just don't care. So where value is accruing is very interesting. Look, I would say four or five ecosystems will make 90% of the gains. And then within certain sectors, we're going to see, again, outsized gains versus other sectors simply because of the easy connectability of these ideas. I think gaming hasn't really had its time yet, really, in this cycle. But as soon as we get one game that really takes off, it's going to go crazy for the whole gaming yeah. sector. It's a very accessible idea, much in the way that I see meme coins. Meme coins. Why are meme coins popular? Because they're simple. They're simple. Most investors are simple. Most investors buy, when they buy stocks, they buy stocks they know, or they, you know, it's interesting that stock ticker symbols, people will buy based on that sometime because it's almost like a meme of itself. So that's a part of reality. You have to look at where investors are, not where you want investors to be, but where investors actually are. This is why meme coins are popular. This is why gaming is going to be popular because it won't matter what the token does. Obviously, the right. better tokens will accrue some kind of value and have in-game mechanisms that actually give them some kind of uh, runway for success. But if people like a game, they're going to buy the tokens. It's just that simple. We talked about a bunch of different narratives. I mean, gaming, base, Solana, et cetera. We'll, we'll dive into more of those in a second. But what matters more right now? Fundamentals, because you said value accrual, or is it mm -hmm. pumpamentals or whatever you want to call it? But like it, in a bull market, does the value accrual really matter right now? Or is it more the meme effect that truly matters? In a bull market, 100% hype, hype and meme yeah. effect. You know, in the bear market, you invest in fundamentals. In the bull market, you invest in what has strength. Because here's the thing. I, I see this all the time. People come and ask me, Lark, what do you think about this thing and this thing and that thing? And like, nobody cares about it. That's why I think about it. And, no, and nobody else is talking about it either. And there's a lot of great coins out there that nobody talks about. They're fundamentally strong. That's a blockchain that does all these exciting things. Or it's whatever nerdy bullshit that does all this exciting stuff. Nobody cares. If nobody cares, nobody's going to buy it. And I see this all the time. I, I remember I was looking at this deck a month ago or so, something like that. And I, I was reading through it and I was just like, what is this 
crap, what is this? Like, I'm sure it's really interesting technology, but you guys are such damn nerds. You can't convey what you're actually talking about here in a simple way that humans can understand. Like I do this full time and I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and so this is the thing is that easily accessible ideas, hype, narrative, strength, that's what matters in a bull market. And you can try and fight that. You can mid-curve it if you want and say, well, actually, that's blah, 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 blah. Nobody cares. The market doesn't care. Look what the market's actually choosing. Not what you want it to choose, what it's actually choosing. And it will tell you what it's choosing. We're seeing that right now. And we'll see some of the narratives pop up. But I think there's some narratives as well that I think are definitely going to be talked about, but in certain ways. Like, for example, Ethereum Layer 2 ecosystem right? Great to farm, great to farm. I think huge potential for farming. Finia, Scroll, ZK Sync in particular, StarkNet, of course, was a, a pretty disappointing airdrop for a lot of people. But, you know, maybe these other three will turn out being really good. The problem is, is that I don't think any of the Ethereum layer two tokens are going to be really good investments. And people are going to buy them because they go, oh, well, because the network metrics, look, they got all these users, they have all this TVL, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but it doesn't mean the token's a good investment. Look at Arbitrum. They're governance tokens. They don't actually accrue any value. So that's something, for example, that will make a lot of money for early investors, but will it continue to make money beyond an airdrop and letting VCs cash out? Probably not, because mm. it just won't have the strength to do that. They'll have a bit of hype around the layer twos, right? But you need a certain amount of fundamentals to back your hype. Not always, obviously, meme coins, zero fundamentals, 100% hype. But when you come to sort of these if you want to look at something as a long-term sort of thing, right? So if, if you want to have um, big success for your token in the long term, you need to have some kind of fundamentals to help back up the hype train because that'll add to the hype train. You could look at, for example, Uniswap versus Jupiter. Very interesting example. So Uniswap, when they launched, they were supposed to do fee sharing. Obviously, they got scared by U.S. regulators. Understandable. U.S. regulators are a nightmare. So they never turned it on. They turned it on for themselves eventually, which fine, I get it. You guys should make money, but they didn't turn it on for the token holders, which was the original promise. A lot of people would have bought in 2021 based on the promise that there was going to be fee sharing because it kept being teased. It's coming soon, coming soon, never came. Still being teased at potentially coming soon. There was a proposal recently. I don't know if anything happened with that, but it failed to accrue value for token holders. So there was hype and narrative in 2021 because of the potential for that. But then reality hit the wall that they didn't ever turn the switch on. And now we see Uniswap still being one of the most, the biggest, most important exchanges, but the token doesn't do anything. There's literally no reason for you to go and buy this token. And then Jupiter launches on Solana, a DEX aggregator technically, but basically decentralized exchange with lots of great features, et cetera, et cetera. And they also had a governance token, but they decided let's actually make value accrue to the governance token and so that's what they did with you know big airdrops coming and sharing launchpad fees and they have a whole incentives program etc cetera, etc cetera. so now if you actually are staking and, and participating in the jupiter governance protocol you're getting big rewards unlike uniswap uniswap could have done something like that but they never decided to so you have to look fundamentals are important they're not valueless in a bear market and they will definitely help your narrative but without narrative Fundamentals don't necessarily matter. Mm. With narrative, with strength, fundamentals can add that extra rocket fuel that can really see assets go crazy. If for a more sustainable market cycle versus like a meme, yeah, meme coin can go from zero to a billion dollars in 24 hours. How's that going to stay up in six months? Mm. Yeah, it needs it needs a little bit of both for it to really for it to really do well. My struggle with investing in alts, like I, I obviously do it, but my struggle is always I can't get any conviction. In just about any altcoin, that I can't put any size into it, and so like even if you get big gains, it's not that meaningful to me. So I, I continue to just hold the ones that I'm like, I know that this is going to do well. The cycle, ETH, Solana, it might not do the best. Like I'm sure if I got an AI token, it's going to do. You know, it has a chance of doing better. But there's a million AI tokens, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I always struggle to like figure out how to allocate my capital properly in the altcoins that I'm sort of eyeing because I can't seem to just like depart from my soul and my ETH enough because I mean, I use it to farm a bunch of points. I'm making yield on it. I know it's going to do well. It's not going to get wrecked as much as all these alts are in the, um, mm -hmm. in the bear market. Mm -hmm. What's your strategy when it comes to alts? Do you just sort of like take a hundred of them, but put a little bit in and hope for the best, or are you very particular? Or like what's your thought process around investing in alts? 
Sure, absolutely. So I, I like your strategy, by the way, and don't don't knock your strategy because it's a decent strategy. If you're using your capital efficiently to farm airdrops and stuff, and look at the Etherfy airdrop, it was huge, right? So, and yeah. if you take your ETH and deploy it efficiently into different protocols, what do we have now? We have I an mean, Etherfy itself is offering like thirty percent right now, which is pretty big. Pendles doing good yields, so there's lots of ways you can use that capital very effectively oh, with to get. And with exactly. Retaking, yeah, yeah. it's insane. Oh, it's insane. It's insane. So there's a lot of great airdrop potential out there for that. And that's the whole skill in itself. You can literally just be farming airdrops and making truckloads of money right now using your existing capital or even doing it for free sometimes. So there's definitely value in that strategy. Now, when it comes to actually buying altcoins, it's a tricky one. I tend not to add new altcoins on a very regular basis. If anything, I'm trying to continually whittle down my yeah, portfolio yeah. to make it more okay. efficient. But every once in a while, you see, I, I don't know, the, the, the light goes off in my brain. I go, that's an obvious play. I need to buy it. Jupiter was such an example. It's like, well, this is the biggest decentralized exchange on Solana. It's regularly doing more volume than Uniswap. It has all these huge uh, staking features and stuff like that. It's going to go crazy as long as Solana narrative continues. So I bought a whole bunch of that around 50, 60 cents, added more as it went up a bit. And it's been one of my best performing positions of this year so far, actually. So fantastic, right? The trick is finding the good altcoin narratives can be a bit of a needle in a haystack scenario sometimes. So you really have to be, I have been anyway, I know maybe I should ape more, but I've been trying to be a little more conservative with my capital, how I actually deploy it. The decisions I make around deploying that capital, I think is something that does take a bit of time because remember, it's your money you work hard for. You shouldn't just randomly throw it at everything you see in the market just because some content creator talked about something from it in their video or you saw a post on something, whatever it might be. You have to be careful, from, guys. This is your money. So you have to actually do the work and wait because there will be those aha moments for you where you look and go, crap, that thing's really got great potential. It's going to take off. So look for, again, Great hype, great strength in the market. And in a lot of cases, you'll actually find decent fundamentals behind that. Like Render, for example, had a crazy bull run already, probably has a lot of potential left. Lots of hype, lots of narrative, AI, et cetera, et cetera. But also interesting fundamentals in the background, big partnerships, all that kind of stuff. So mm. you kind of get both working together there. It's interesting because that's public market, right? Public market is one thing. I think there's incredible opportunities right now in public markets for um, investors. When it comes to private market investing, which is you know, getting into pre-sales and stuff like this or OTC deals, I have maybe a bit more of an open approach because you're... you're essentially investing in startups. And usually when tokens launch in the market for like Jupiter, for example, they years of track record already, huge growth. You can see what you're kind of getting yourself into. When you invest in a pre-sale, it's a little more like, I hope that uh, you will turn out with all your promises. Half the time it's true, half the time it's not. So it's problematic. And obviously you try to find the best ones and all that stuff, but I'm open to a bit more risk, let's say, versus public market investing with my private, private market investing. But um, it's also a very interesting space to invest in, but it's not accessible, of course, to uh, most people in the market. It's a bit harder to get into. Yeah, for sure. In, in a completely different strategy, for sure. How many assets would you say that you're holding right now across probably many wallets as well? But what do you, what would you say your portfolio is? Right now, I'm holding probably, hmm, let me tell you, did my count for the tax man recently. There are a total <laughs> of about 46 assets, but that, that number wow. is a bit, it's a bit of a misrepresentation because it's like, usdt but also right. usdc and those are two right. different or assets like or, yeah yeah, okay. yeah wrapped eth ether eth kelp eth etc so those are all different assets technically right so that's something to consider or like yeah i've got like 10 solana or something like that which i don't even really count as an investment because it's just like used for screwing around on the solana network but i have to count that too so i would right. say total liquid public market coins invested in right now are about probably about 20. 20 or something in my okay. portfolio approximately okay. too many smaller than what i thought though <laughs> but yeah. it is too many my thing hey, is know. always like i try to consolidate the more assets you hold the harder it is for you to actually know the fundamentals and know you know what's going on oh, with yeah. each token 100 and so you end up you're more of a gamble at that point when you have 20 30 40 50 tokens which i know a lot of people do i always try to like get it under 10 it's hard oh. but it, otherwise it's just too much for your mind to figure out yeah you don't know you don't need so many things and there's there's some things that i have that are like um like i have some celestia which is very specifically for like trying to get airdrops and that's part of like the 10k to 100k challenge we're doing in the newsletter and stuff like that so like there's things like that that get counted too but they're not right. like you know big positions sort of thing then i think i'm invested in about probably 50 different 
pre-sales right now, which is a lot, obviously, but and that's it's a lot of different time frames. You know, most this is the thing. A lot of these things are, they're even like next cycle plays. You know, these mm. it's again, it's a whole different market, the private market. And it's I know a lot of people are like, you're just gonna make a bunch of money in the private market. Yeah, it's not always the case. Half these, you know, not half these, but certainly some of these things won't even launch. That's happened before. Or when they do launch, they launch in they launch in the bear market. You have no control over this stuff, right? So it's a tricky marketplace, but I think there's a lot of great gems in there too. And the the winners more than make up for the losers, of course. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. In, um, in your private markets, and feel free to to expand this out to your public markets as well. What were the narratives that you were typically investing in? And I assume these investments were probably much earlier in this cycle, uh, unless you're still doing a bunch of, uh, of private. I'm not sure, but what are the narratives yep. that you're diving into? It's interesting. I've got I've got things I invested in in like twenty late twenty twenty one, early twenty twenty two. They're just now coming to market, right? So <laughs> it's not it's not the easy game that everybody likes to point out to be all the time. So it's there's been a lot of challenges in that. And of course, between now and then, some companies have gone bankrupt, right? right? Or they just didn't make it through the bear market for one reason or another. But my main focus, I think, in this area has been on gaming and DeFi and uh, AI. So okay. a lot more AI pre. A, a lot more AI plays recently. Of course, a lot of AI stuff coming to market. Everyone's trying to jump on that train. There are some pretty good ones coming. A lot of hype and bullshit too. That's you know hard to sift through the reality sometimes. What I haven't been investing in is like NFT marketplaces and stuff like that. I still see people trying to launch new NFT marketplaces. And it's like, man, we already have like 50 of them and only two of them have any volume. Like, what's the point? And look, I, I think those are interesting areas for me personally, because I, I feel like I, I get them and I understand, like I've done a lot of research in AI. I get it, right? I've done a lot of research in gaming. I get it. DeFi, it's interesting. I don't think it's going to be quite as big this cycle as it was last cycle, but I like it. I like the idea of the money Legos and all this screwing around with stuff. It's interesting for me. There's some narratives though that I'm not really investing very much in, like real world assets. It's going to be big. It's going to be great. Ah, I just, I'm struggling to like want to get into that narrative as well or right. like decentralized science like yeah, yeah you know I, just, I don't need to yeah i don't need to get into that as well or decentralized social media I haven't really gone down that rabbit hole either you know i think farcaster might finally be doing something worth paying attention to in the decentralized social media space but i don't know i just look back and when i look at the space right now and i'm investing i know everybody comes in like oh my gosh this thing decentralized social media it's the new paradigm of money and like Come on, guys. We've been doing this since I've been doing all this stuff since 2017. I've seen literally every single one of these pitch decks before. I've seen every single one of these projects before in some kind of iteration. We've done decentralized social media nonstop for seven, eight years now. Yeah. Maybe now is finally the time when one of them's really going to take off. But a lot of it's still just early experimentation and rotating. What is it playing? Um, like Duck Duck Goose or whatever, or rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic for a lot of these things. Like Friend Tech, for example. Friend Tech, hey, cool, fun idea. But then suddenly it goes downhill very, very quickly when influencers suddenly figured out, oh, I can just go buy all my own tokens and everybody has to spend two ETH to be able to send me a DM. It's craziness. Yeah. Who can afford that crap? You know, so it's yeah. there's a lot of interesting experiments and I love experimentation. But at the same time, as I've said a long time with like social media, particularly like maybe maybe Warpcast or Farcast or whatever, they they can break through and become a real powerful crypto-based social media app. But for the most part, you're going up against Amazon or Amazon, uh, Facebook, Twitter, in Instagram, biggest companies in the world. And people don't tend to want to leave their places, especially not to come and like do crypto stuff. So it could have a crypto native vibe. And one of them will take off, but you know. It's not as easy as people think. That's yeah, sure. and it's, it's, it's a less exciting <laughs> area for me to invest in, I would say. Yeah. Although real world assets was number two out of all the, the different sectors or narratives for Q1 of 2024 in terms of performance. Meme coins, number one. This is according to CoinGecko. They put out a little thing. But it, meme coins, number one. RWA tokens was number two. I was like, whoa, really? I think AI was third. So there was some alpha there. There was some alpha there. All That's right. Really as, we, um, as we start to wrap up, Lark, question. Let's talk about the end of the cycle. So as you said already, you think probably the end of the end of 2025, somewhere around there. What are the things that you're looking at? The indicators, whether these be, you know, you mentioned a few, I think you said the pie signal, the, the MVRV, things like that. What are the things that you're looking for to go, okay, we're in phase four, as you called it. We are near the top. It is time to start getting out of markets or getting out of the riskier assets. Like walk me through sort of your strategy around that. Sure. So it, it's a combination of social and technical indicators, right? And you can technical indicators are chart, but also on chain. So on chain sort of stuff, is a great website called lookintobitcoin.com. They have a lot of these great um, charts for free. Everybody can go look at them. 
something like the net unrealized profit loss, the NUPL, when that gets at or near the pink box, that means the market's pretty gosh darn overheated, probably time to get out. You can look at the long-term, short-term holder ratio for Bitcoin. When that looks like a bottom, like a big valley, and it's just starting to trend back up a little bit on the other side, time to get out, right? That's historically been a pretty good time to get out of the market. The MVRVZ score, just go look at the chart. It's pretty simple. When it's in the pink box or near the pink box, time to get out of the markets. <laughs> Again, right? It just, it just shows the extremes of the market, the extreme ends of the market. And so when historically that has happened, that's a good time to book some profits in. Th those are sort of more on-chain things. If we're looking at technical indicators, there's a lot of interesting ones you can look at. Of course, you can sort of try and have a general projection versus the Fibonacci, which for Bitcoin, Fibonacci gives us around $215,000. Might pump up to two fifty dollars as sort of the peak, peak right price. But if you're getting out at like 210, 215 based on the Fibonacci, you're probably doing pretty okay. By the way, Pi Cycle Top Indicator has basically, again, you can find that looking at Bitcoin.com, Pi Cycle Top Indicator has basically hit the peak prices uh, within a few days of the past few cycles. So it's worth paying attention to, will it perform again this time? Some people will say, no, the ETFs is going to just uh, distort it. We shall see, but it's worth paying attention to as an indicator when you're looking at everything else. So technical stuff, loss of like late things, for example, late signals that you may say, hey, okay, I didn't sell when all this other stuff was happening, but maybe now I want to get out. So obviously Fibonacci is great as an earlier indicator for where price could go. BTC 215, ETH 15K, Solana's um, around a thousand bucks, for example. But then, okay, you, you didn't pay attention to that, ignored all that stuff. Well, you can still get out later and still get most of your profits. So if you look for, for example, the bear cross on the weekly MACD. That's an interesting one. Or if you look for a loss of the 200 day EMA, that's going to be a bit late, right? That happened around 45 K or something in early 2022 for Bitcoin, but selling at 45 K probably sounded like a really good idea in hindsight versus holding down to 15 K. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, you don't have to try, you don't have to play that game, but you can play that game. And of course, that was probably the last chance to sell altcoins at profits before they all went down another 90%. So that's something to keep in mind. Those are later things, though, later signals. When Bitcoin monthly RSI hits 90, that's definitely a signal. Markets are massively overheated. You should be paying attention and consider booking some kind of uh, profits in. Social factors come into play here as well. I know we talk about the Coinbase app, but last few cycles, it has basically hit where it hits the number one position and then about 10 to 14 days later, altcoins stop, and then the bear market begins, essentially. So that's worth paying attention to. If you also want to look for Binance or Crypto.com, the top 10 downloaded apps. So this is basically massive cryptomania, massive euphoria, and maybe it doesn't repeat this time. Okay, we always have to consider that maybe these things don't repeat this time, but these are things that previously have allowed us to look at and say this is when the market tops are forming. Again, social sentiment factors, huge greed on the timeline, huge euphoria on the timeline, people posting Rolexes and stuff that they just bought. People not influencer people, people who already have money, people who don't have money posting this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, okay? Because people, influencers have money, they're always buying this crap anyway. But we're talking about people who don't have money, the old college friends calling up and saying, hey, can I buy dog coins? What's a good dog coin that you can recommend? All this kind of stuff. So it's a mix of social factors, but the social factors are a good addition yeah, yeah, to your thesis and a good guide. And go look at the Wall Street cheat sheet. Look at the chart. Look at how the chart looks. Look at the emotional patterns people are going through and then really ask yourself, you have to be honest with yourself. And this is the hardest thing for investors to do is to be honest with themselves and say, to look at the market and go, wow, that's really what's happening. Again, you have to be able to look at the market and see what's actually happening, not what you want to be happening. And that's hard mm -hmm. to do. I've fallen into that mistake before, obviously, right? We, when the top comes in, you don't want to believe it's the top. You want to believe it's going to keep going forever. You want to believe the super cycle theory. You want to believe that it's going to go to a valuation that's more insane than you could possibly think. But chances are it's time to take profits. And if you don't take your profits, the market will take them for you. There will be no orderly exit from this market. <laughs> There's no guy standing there saying, right this way, everybody, come over here and take your maximum profits possible. No, it doesn't work like that. Markets are chaos. It's player versus player. And if you don't sell, if you don't sell, here's the thing. I have an insight into the future of everybody who doesn't sell their altcoins. You'll be sitting when prices are down 99% in a Reddit group or a Telegram somewhere at the other five guys who didn't sell, talking about how it's such a big scam and everything's shit. And you know, the guy who did sell, that dude's sailing away on a yacht with his wife and his kids in the Caribbean, 
love in the bear market because he took his profits. You get to choose which of those people you're going to be. Most will, by lack of making a choice, will make the choice to be the guy, the, the bag holder, the community member in the bear market. You don't <laughs> want to be that guy. You want to be the guy sailing away on the yacht. Okay. You really do guys, because it's true. It's true. It's true. A lot of community members out there for a lot of coins that are never coming back, man. I think the one mistake people make trying to get the top is they actually try to hit the peak top. It's like almost no one hits the peak top. You no. don't need to try to hit the peak top. Just get somewhere near the top or maybe you're past the top and you're on the way down. Like it's all good. You know, that peak top that like 69 K of Bitcoin last cycle was for like one day, you know, not even yeah. probably like, like literally, you have to think, literally like one person sold the perfect yeah. top because that's yeah, how it yeah, works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not like everybody got to sell up there. No, like literally one person maybe sold yeah. up, up that, that exact peak price. So you have to keep this in mind, guys. You don't need to catch the exact bottom to buy and you don't need to catch the exact top to sell. You have to just catch the meat of the move, which is going to be yeah. in the middle, actually. And here's another bit of advice for people. You don't have to sell everything all at once. Mm -hmm. This is what screws a lot of people up. And actually, if you start creating a habit of selling, we're not, you know, quite at the Start selling everything phase. We probably have another six months where you can still get some pretty good deals in the market before really you have to change gears completely and say, okay, now it's selling time. Now I have to look at when do I start selling assets? Because you don't need to keep buying forever. If you keep buying forever, then you're buying the top and you're probably then panic selling the bottom. You don't want to do that. You got probably another good six months left of really great opportunities of buying. And then, then it's going to start to change where you want to think, okay, yeah, you can still farm some airdrops, get some token sales, whatever. There's still going to be stuff, right? But broadly speaking, it's going to be late in the game for accumulating and you need to flip the switch then and start thinking about selling and you don't have to perfectly sell the top because you're not going to you need to disabuse yourself of that mentality because it's simply not going to happen for you you're not going to be the exception you're going to be the rule in the market you have to operate based on that assumption so make habit of selling and when you see a coin that's up in your portfolio 10 or 20x you know what rebalance a little you don't have to sell the whole position Maybe you sell 5% of that or 10% of that because now you're creating a habit. You're not a person who just holds your bags forever. You're a seller. You create the identity. If you're a person who sells and takes profit and makes money in this market, and when you have a habit of selling, and let me tell you, let me tell you, every time that I've sold anything at a profit, it is a relief. I feel good. I feel good every time, not just because I made the money, but because I clicked the sell button. And especially when you've completely exited a position, it just feels psychologically good right? Selling feels good. So get over the fear of selling and get in tune with the joy of selling and create the habit of selling. Because selling is actually a really positive thing. It's why you're here in the first place. And a lot of people are going to look at that life-changing money on the table and fail to change their life. There's one thing I can leave everybody with is that if you get to the situation in this market, and a lot of you will more than you realize because markets will go crazier than you realize. If you get into a position where you're sitting on life changing money, for the love of God, change your life. Don't round trip it. Don't don't watch it go down 99% become a community member, guys. Come on. It's not worth it. Investing is like 80, 90% at least psychology. It's all mm -hmm. about training your brain to not do the stupid thing and, and just do the like, it doesn't have to be the smart thing. Honestly, you don't have to be that smart to be successful in crypto, especially in these cycles. You just got to do the right thing, but it's, it's very hard to control your emotions, control that psychology aspect. If you can just study psychology and like learn your own habits, it's, investing in crypto becomes so much, so much easier. But most people forget the psychology part, right? They do all the research, they're studying CoinGecko and TA, and then they forget the psychology aspect, but it's so important. So great advice. Lark, we're, we're running out of time here. We could probably talk all day and get all the advice that you have up in your, that brain of yours, but we can't. So first, thank you for joining. This was super, super helpful. I'm sure the audience is going to absolutely love this, but I know the audience is going to want more and I don't have time to ask you more and more and more. So where can those listening learn more about the things that you're teaching, maybe some of the narratives that you're investing in, some of the assets that you're investing in, if they want to get more from you, where can they go? So the best place is to follow me. Just come over to X or YouTube. Look for Lark Davids, verified accounts. We have verified accounts. So make sure yeah, there's a lot of account. fake accounts. So watch oh, out. Oh my gosh, it's wild. And ones if with I... lots of followers too. So like you really got to do your yeah. due diligence here when you're <laughs> trying to follow Lark. Yeah. So go go <laughs> go follow us over there on X or YouTube or come and find us at the newsletter, thewealthmastery.io, where you can join along with all the insights and alpha we're sharing every week over there too. It is a killer newsletter, by the way. I highly recommend you check it out. It is very in-depth. And like if you want alpha, like you want to go down a narrative and then go really down a narrative, the Wealth Mastery newsletter is the best one for that. 
if you're a DGen, or if you really want to know what's going on in the space, then I highly recommend it. Lark, thanks so much for joining us. This was awesome. It's great to have you on. We'll have to get you back on to Milk Road Radio again sometime soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. If you like this episode, share it and hit subscribe or follow so you don't miss out on the next one. There's also a link in the description to our free five-minute daily newsletter where we simplify crypto for you while making you laugh. And if you're willing to step up your crypto investing game, then we'll leave a link to Milk Road Pro as well, your number one resource to help you invest successfully in crypto. One final note, this podcast is for educational purposes purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto is risky, so you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and we'll see you in the next one.